Good morning. My name is Cheryl Neely, and I'm the moderator for the Foreign Press Center today. Welcome to the Foreign Press Center's video conference briefing to preview tomorrow's NATO Defense Ministerial. The meeting host will now mute all journalists' microphones. Please keep your microphone muted until you are called on to ask a question. You may record the briefing by clicking on the record button on the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you have technical problems during the briefing, you can use the chat feature and the meeting host or one of my colleagues will try to assist you. If the Zoom session fails or disconnects, please click on the link again and sign back in to rejoin. The ground rules today are that this briefing is on the record. I'd like to introduce our briefer, Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison. Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison has served as permanent representative to, uh, of the United States to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization since 2017. From 1993 to 2013, she served as a US Senator from Texas and was also elected to a Senate leadership position, pardon me, leadership position. Ambassador Hutchison gained extensive international experience and developed a deep understanding of NATO as a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Prior to being elected to the Senate, she was a practicing attorney and held state offices in Texas. Ambassador Hutchison will give an opening statement and then I will open the session to questions and answers. Thank you. Go ahead, Ambassador. Thank you, Cheryl, and thank all of you for participating. We are looking forward to having all of our defense ministers in a meeting tomorrow, virtual, of course, because no one is traveling. But we do think this is a very important time to have an emergency called meeting because of the way the COVID-19 is affecting all of our countries and something that we are addressing right now, but we're also looking to plan for the future so that if we have another uh, situation in which we have a pandemic that affects all of our countries at the same time, we will have even more capabilities to help each other. We are helping each other. Allies are adding uh, so much equipment and aid to other allies, especially where the hotspots are in Europe and in the United States and Canada, of course. And we are really pleased that NATO could have a strong role in transporting equipment because we do have those capabilities in Europe and particularly now NATO is the central point where allies can call and say what they need and NATO can find the transportation and coordinate getting equipment and help for our countries. Let me say that we have um, also our missions that are ongoing throughout the world. Afghanistan is a, a mission, of course, where we are focusing on troop protection and making sure that our forces are safe when they're in the field. The uh, mission that we had in Iraq has been put on hold because Iraq has been affected by the virus and the situation in Iran where the virus is very uh, much uh, a problem and it has gone over into Iraq. And then of course we have Kosovo and enhanced forward presence in Europe where we are taking all the measures that we possibly can to protect our troops wherever they are in Europe or in the Middle East. It is also, I think, um, the last point I will make. It's very important that we also, and I, th I think Secretary Esper will stress this tomorrow as well, that we look at the role defense has played in the response of all of our countries. We have seen in America our military building pop-up hospitals, uh, trying to make sure that we have not only equipment, but also transportation and military personnel who are so experienced in uh, trying to uh, serve people 
in time of need and our military personnel have stepped up to the plate in all of our alliance doing the things that our people need to do that our publics need to have um, and we're very proud that nato could play a part but also to emphasize that the defense spending that we have increased in the last few years is making us more ready and more capable to help our publics in this great time that they have called on the military for the added help that our healthcare systems just couldn't provide with this pandemic situation. So I'm very pleased that we will have the defense ministerial tomorrow and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have today. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Okay, uh, one more time. If you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand via the Zoom platform. To do that, click on manage, uh, click on participants at the bottom. It will open a window and you will find the raise hand feature at the bottom left of that screen. Um, please make sure that your name and outlet are showing. And when you ask a question, please introduce yourself with your name, outlet, and country. Um, if you used a mobile phone to access the Zoom video link, the raise hand button is located also at the bottom of the participant screen. Um, if you dialed in as a telephone call, you can unmute by pressing star six. Please wait until I call on you to do so. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, I, we have James Hurst first from um, British Forces. Please go Good ahead, Jay. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for briefing us. The NATO Secretary General this morning made clear that he thinks going forward, there are important lessons to be learned about national resilience. I wonder what your thought is uh, about that and whether that is something for, for NATO to be involved in, and particularly whether you, where you see any weak spots or strong spots in resilience from this. Yes, thank you, James. That's a very good question. And I think there, there is a unique role that NATO can play in planning for the future. Uh, all of us were surprised that we would have a pandemic affecting every one of our countries at the same time. Normally we would have a regional uh, issue and we would address that all together. But now we are going to learn from this experience that we have to be prepared for something that could affect us so totally at the same time. So we are going to ask uh, our NATO leaders and our military leaders to put forward plans from what we have learned in this. For instance, uh, we are suggesting that, that we have a warehouse in which we would have non-perishable equipment, but the things that we all know we were short of in this epidemic. And if we could have warehousing of that, which NATO certainly has the capability to do, and then if the NATO forces could inventory transport capabilities that could be air it could also be train rail it could be highway um, but we have capabilities at nato to coordinate something like this and get the equipment in much faster and i think what our military has shown is the ability to do these instant hospitals so that if we have large numbers of people affected, uh, our military experience is going to show us how we can do this even more effectively and more quickly uh, so that we are more prepared. So I think NATO is going to take a role. I think we can look at this as a service for our publics. This is a healthcare crisis, but it could be a security crisis as well. It could be a security crisis if we let down on our defenses and deterrent activities. Our adversaries will be watching to see if that is the case, which it is not at this time, but we can also prepare for that in the future. But it could also be a security risk if this kind of um, 
eventuality is an eventuality that is used in warfare or to attack each other. These are the things that we must learn from and prepare for that it could be healthcare today, but it could be defense tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, next question comes from Robert Papa with Albanian TV. Yeah. Hungary, Albania, and Turkey are so harsh on their people. What do you think about Albanian government lockdowns? They are asking for 15 years in prison if somebody gets out. I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, Cheryl, did, did you understand? No, what? but, but he, uh, Robert, could you ask again yeah. the question? Albanian government is so harsh on the people about lockdowns. They're asking 15 years in prison for the people getting out. Oh, I see. Yes, I understand um, that this is harsh. Um, the national governments are able to make their own decisions, of course, on how they would um, punish people who are not wearing face masks or who are not protecting not only themselves, but people around them. And I, I think that has to be a sovereign decision. Uh, I do think that the message is such an important one that we all have a responsibility to protect ourselves, even if we don't have formal masks. I think the makeshift coverings of our faces are also very important. I thought, um, I think many people are giving good examples. Our first lady is giving a good example of wearing a mask and how you would put one on. And I think that our leaders need to reinforce this very important safety measure that not only protect each individual, but it affect all of the people around us. We know that this is a an airborne, unseeable virus but it is having a deadly impact. And it is incumbent on all of us to listen to our leaders, to take their example and to go forward, helping each other in this very important, but very easily accomplished way. Okay, thank you. Next, let's take uh, Marcin Rona from TVN Polish TV. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Ambassador, for uh, doing this, and uh, good evening. Um, now, uh, with the outbreak, which is present basically everywhere, including uh, military bases, and uh, recently uh, it's, it's even present on uh, board of uh, Navy ships, uh, not to mention, you know, the, uh, the aircraft carrier. Uh, is U.S. military and NATO in general uh, fully operational? Uh, does it still have full capabilities? And aren't you afraid that some bad actors might try uh, to use this crisis uh, to their benefit? Thank you. I think that, um, again, is very important. Our adversaries are watching. Our military is ready. Uh, in all of our missions, except for Iraq, which is temporarily on pause, but we are ready to go. We are continuing to do our deterrence and defense uh, capabilities, and our adversaries should be put on notice that we could certainly uh, respond to any kind of aggressive measure that might be taken. Um, at the same time, we are also trying to help each other. We're trying to make sure that in a humanitarian crisis, we are doing everything we can to support our troops who are in the field doing these jobs. So we're taking every measure, for instance, in Afghanistan, if, if there are troops coming in, they have a 14 day quarantine before they enter. Uh, we are working very hard to assure that our troops do have that back up and it's very hard in some instances when our troops are used to uh, working together living together um, and we're working through that but make no mistake 
our deterrence is absolutely intact and ready to respond to any military crisis that we might face. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Next, we'll go to Nicholas Fiorenza from Jane's. Nicholas Fiorenza. To unmute. Okay. Oops. Yes, can you please start again? We just unmuted you. Um, yes, hello, um, Ambassador. Thank you for uh, taking our questions. Uh, my question was, uh, in fact, uh, there was an interesting um, uh, piece by uh, the uh, Atlantic Council President and CEO Frederick Hempe um, a couple of weeks ago um, proposing that the U.S. invoke um, Article 5 of the NATO Treaty uh, on uh, for uh, COVID-19 as it as was done uh, after the 11th of uh, September, uh, uh, the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks. Well, yes, the only time Article 5 has been invoked, of course, was after 9-11. I think all of us are coming together uh, right now to fight COVID. And they are, uh, COVID, the virus is our enemy, but there has been no discussion of an Article 5 being necessary because we are already coming together to help each other and try to provide uh, the provisions that our, our separate countries need. And I think we're in different phases in our different countries on the, the enormity of the situation. But certainly the United States is now topping all of our allies in numbers of deaths. And so we are focused on trying to make sure that our Americans are taken care of and we're reaching out, uh, our president, our governors are all uh, reaching out to do the most that we can. And our military has stepped up to the plate. Our National Guard and our active duty military are filling in where hospital workers are overworked and strained and sparse. And I think all of us are saluting our, our healthcare workers wherever we are, every one of our allies now has healthcare workers in the field and our military are in many instances helping them and augmenting the services they are providing. Uh, so there hasn't been a, a, a formal Article 5 on this virus, but there certainly is an informal one that all of us are allied in fighting together. Thank you, Ambassador. Next, we'll take Danila, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Galperovic from Voice of America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, yes. Voice of America, Russian service. Uh, Thank you. I have, I have a question as a follow-up to this morning press conference of uh, Secretary Stoltenberg. He said that one of the major uh, topics for discussion will be disinformation. And uh, can you please give us first your perception of what disinformation campaign is going on now? What kind of it? Uh, from what countries? What examples? And second, what practical measures could NATO take to, to deter this disinformation to fight it? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I think that is a very valid observation. Uh, we are concerned about disinformation that is being put forward by Russia and China uh, about how this all started. And I think there's a lot of criticism of our different government leaders uh, trying to sow discontent in our alliance and with our partners. And we at NATO, uh, this is one of the areas where we are asking all of our allies to push back with the facts. NATO will do the same. Um, and we also think we can do better for learning from this experience. No one thought that our adversaries would uh, try to sow discontent at a time like this, but they have, and they've also falsely uh, reported that they are trying to help. Uh, they have falsely reported that 
uh, this virus started either in Europe or in the United States, depending on which outlet uh, is uh, providing disinformation. All of this is absolutely false. And we are trying to answer the misinformation with facts. Uh, this is all part of the hybrid and cyber warfare that we see constantly within our alliance, trying to sow uh, not only discontent, but uh, trying to devalue our leadership at a time when our publics need to look to our leadership for the protection and the help that they need. So we are vigorously pushing back and we think that uh, we can even do more uh, through the Alliance in a concerted way to say, knock off the disinformation in this humanitarian crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Next, we will take uh, Boris Kamchev from the North Macedonian Information Agency. Boris, are you there? Let me see. Yeah, uh, I, I just turned on my microphone. Uh, thank you for thank you for doing this, uh, Ms. Ambassador. Uh, I have a question regarding the uh, North Macedonia uh, started to use next generation incident command system uh, NICS uh, instrument for uh, response in uh, in emergency situations. Uh, can you explain for all of us? Uh, what, what is this instrument and how, how it, it works, uh, especially for those countries in the Western Balkans who are dealing with the coronavirus? Thank you. Yes, well, first of all, we're very pleased to have our 30th member of NATO, North Macedonia, mm -hmm. and are pleased that we have already been able to send help, uh, equipment to North Macedonia. And I, I was glad that because you've, been a member for just a few weeks that you did call NATO and we were able to deliver uh, equipment into um, your country. Also, of course, you're right. There has been a lot of this dis disinformation in North Macedonia and others in the Western Balkans uh, because, um, and I have to say that has been ongoing for a long time because Russia in particular has tried to sow uh, disinformation, really tried to keep North Macedonia from seeking to be a member of NATO. And then when the accession was accepted, um, has continued to put disinformation into North Macedonia, which we are trying to, um, to direct against with the facts that North Macedonia is being supported by NATO. They are a full-fledged member uh, of NATO. They are an ally and we are helping them in this crisis and we will continue to help them with the disinformation that is com coming in from Russian sources. Thank you. Um, next we have Nick Terse with The Intercept. Nick, are you there? Okay. You know, go ahead, before, it, if we don't have Nick, let me go back to the North Macedonia question and just say we also have counter hybrid support teams that have been put together. The first group went into uh, Montenegro, one of the neighbors for North Macedonia. And I think that those will be available to Northern Macedonia as well to prepare uh, the North Macedonian media uh, to repel these disinformation campaigns. So I should have answered that more fully about what, what you could expect uh, because we do have those working in Montenegro and we will certainly look to uh, answer a request from North Macedonia of these hybrid support teams to train the people there 
to repel these disinformation campaigns coming in. Can you hear me Thank now? You. I'm sorry, let's uh, take the next question from Guido Lafranchi Hello? from The Diplomat Netherlands. Thank you very much for, for your briefing, madam. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, beyond cooperation, there have also been some reports of tensions uh, between NATO members. So there have been these reports of the US outbidding some European partners on some medical supplies, and there has been some polemic on this issue. Will this be tackled by the defense ministers uh, tomorrow, or will it be tackled elsewhere by uh, at some different levels? Thank you very much. Well, we have certainly tried to uh, answer that ridiculous um, assertion, uh, and it doesn't even bear repeating that um, America would steal uh, equipment from any other country, even one we didn't like, but especially not our own allies and partners. So um, that was repelled forcefully. We hope it didn't go very far. Uh, but it is things like that that are just uh, amazing that anyone would say something uh, like that. But there are so many uh, other things that are being said that seem ridiculous, but if people don't have the facts, they can't make the decision that uh, this is something that would never happen. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. We have um, Lailuma Sadid. Could you please make sure to um, state your country and outlet? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Lailuma Sadid, freelance journalist for different media in Afghanistan. I would like to ask a question about how does assess uh, uh, attacks by Taliban, which is continuous violence against ANDS, and what is the impact on, in the peace process? And second question, uh, I'm asking about one billion cut, uh, uh, which is a uh, uh, foreign minister announced one billion cut aid in Afghanistan. Could you please give some information about this one billion cut is cost for the military section or it's in the other part. Thank you very much. Yes, L let me say that all of our countries are looking forward and pushing forward for the Taliban to keep its word, both in spirit as well as in detail, uh, that the violence would subside. It has not, and we are calling on the Taliban, all of us, to uh, lessen the violence, to cease fire, especially in this humanitarian crisis when uh, the people of Afghanistan are affected and, and most certainly the Afghan troops who are fighting valiantly for the peace for their country um, to have to uh, have attacks against them by the Taliban is outrageous. On the other hand, the leadership of Afghanistan, the uh, President Ghani and uh, Mr. Abdullah need to come together and show the strength of a unified government. It will take that to start the peace process and for the Taliban to sit down with the government appointees who are representative of the different factions and areas uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, the two leaders have both blessed that uh, negotiating group as representative of the people of Afghanistan. And we call on the Taliban to stop the delays, to stop the violence and to begin the peace process. Uh, some Progress was made this weekend with the exchange of prisoners. That was part of the agreement that was made. Uh, those exchanges were made. That is one step in the right direction. We need all of the Afghan people to encourage their leaders and the Taliban to continue forward for the sit down 
uh, around the table of the Afghan people to make a peace that they can all live with so that they will have what they rightly deserve, which is freedom, human rights, equality, education for all in that country. Uh, that's what we want for the people of Afghanistan. And none of us who are helping to bring that together want to be a factor uh, that would uh, be the deciding factor in that peace agreement. We want the Afghan people to speak uh, for their government to be as it should be for them as they want it to be. And we're very much hoping that all the sides can come together to begin that process in earnest. Thank you. Do we have time for one final question, Ambassador? Okay, we'll take one final question. Um, Evelyn Caldoja, could you please be sure to state your outlet and country? Okay, I'm Evelyn Caldoja from Estonian Daily Postimes. And I have a question about defense expenditures. Uh, considering that all the GDPs of NATO countries are now probably going to decrease, and also many citizens will probably like their governments to spend rather on health or, or social issues. Do you think NATO would also have to adapt the message on defense expenditure? I think it will be more important than ever for our defense expenditures to stay at the higher levels that we have committed to do, all of us have committed uh, to increase defense spending. And we need to continue to keep those commitments because we now see that first of all, security is our most important asset. That is what makes for the democracies and the peace that we all live in. And secondly, I think we have seen that the defense spending has been such an important part of the response in this humanitarian crisis, in this healthcare crisis. And the defense techniques for dealing with the pandemic have been an asset to all of our countries. So both our partners as you are and our allies um, I think the defense spending is going to be essential that we keep in our priorities and that all of us have also um, gotten such a benefit from the added military component of the response that I think that in itself would say that we need to keep that training and that equipment ready to go for any kind of pandemic or defense capability that we would need in the future. That's what we're doing together. Okay, thank you so much, Ambassador, for your time today. We really do appreciate you being with us. I'd like to thank all of our journalists as well. We um, did not get to all of the questions in the time that we had. So if you would like to send a um, question or a follow-up, please route your question to dcfpc at state.gov. That's DC for Washington, DC, FPC for Foreign Press Center, at state for State Department, dot gov for government. And uh, we will route those to our mission um, to NATO and for follow-up and um, we hope to have the transcript ready this afternoon or first thing tomorrow morning. The video will also be on our website at fpc.state.gov. Thank you all for participating and that ends our briefing for today. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We'll now close the meeting. Health to everyone, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Goodbye. Be safe. Thank you.